so by ways of introduction, my name is Mike DiPetrello. Uh, I'm with VMware. I've been here for about uh, just shy of nine years. When we have VMworld Europe in a, about a month, it'll be my nine-year anniversary here. Uh, I am the, currently the global cloud architect for VMware. So I've had this role for about two years now um, and had many other roles inside of VMware along the way. Um, and then I'm very pleased to have a partner in crime for this presentation that's a little bit more network savvy than I am, I guess. Uh, so I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, hi, my name is Charlie Cano. I'm a senior solution architect with F5 Networks and been with F5 for about seven years and for the last two and a half or so uh, and dedicated sort of completely on VMware and our sort of joint solutions. Um, we've done a couple of them last year, uh, introduced some sort of long distance vMotion. This year we've been working a lot with vCloud and Cloud Director and a lot of just the networking uh, around cloud, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'll just sort of warn I'm not doing any sort of vendor pitch by any means, but more just, uh, just some of the challenges around vCloud, so. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie. So, the good old disclaimer slide, what you see in here doesn't actually exist. All right, pass that from the VMware perspective. Um, so, a brief kind of roundup of what we're going to do from an agenda. We already did the introductions, but we're going to go into a little bit of an overview for vCloud Director, because uh, it's fairly new to some people. We just released it on Tuesday. Um, and then we'll talk about what things come about in cloud from a networking perspective that are really, really hard, and then some best practices to try and solve that. And then we're going to do a demo at the end that sort of brings it all together and shows you how we can actually kind of get around this in a real world type of scenario. So hang tight with us. Uh, if you have questions, just go ahead and raise your hand, shout. This is a ginormous room for the 30 or 40 people that we have in here. Um, so just kind of shout really, really loud and we'll repeat your question along the way. So with that, Going to hand it back to you sure. for some kick uh, Very briefly, how many of y'all know who F5 is or F5 Networks? Cool. Just going to take a couple of seconds for those of you who don't. Um, as I said, this isn't a vendor pitch, but just so you're a little familiar where my background is coming from. F5 Networks, uh, we're application delivery networking. We sit between users and applications and do lots of cool stuff uh, in terms of networking for that. So acceleration, security, that type of thing. We have both physical and virtual appliances. And I'm going to leave it at that. We've a very strong partner with VMware. I've been working with them over, over two years now. Um, and I live and breathe this stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's a very strong partnership. So just a quick raise of hands. How many of you were vCloud Director uh, beta participants? Got just a you. couple. All right. Um, how many of you have played with it in the lab? The lab's here. Oh, a few more. If you haven't, you should go check it out. The labs are very, very cool. They close at 4. Oh, they close at 4. <laughs> oh. You can race over there. Uh, how many of you plan to deploy a public or private cloud, say, in the next 12 months? A couple more. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, um, I'm going to hand it back over. We're just going to dive a little bit into Cloud Director and move from there. Perfect. So from a VMware perspective, we have uh, a couple different things that make up our cloud solution that we're bolting together now. The first thing down towards the bottom of this is vSphere. So this is your traditional vSphere setup. You don't have to do anything new or fancy or change any of your best practices for vSphere. You use it just like you always have. On top of that, we've put vCloud Director, and we'll talk about some of the things that it enables you to do in just a little bit. Um, we also have vShield Edge, which we'll also talk about in depth in this uh, presentation. It does sort of all of our funky networking stuff, and uh, funky is probably an accurate description for how it does it. Uh, we also have vCenter chargeback for all the billing and chargeback, the stuff that comes along the way. And then on top of all this stuff, we have the vCloud API uh, that allows programmatic access to this so you can sort of federate these things together. And you'll see how that actually gets taken advantage of when we get into the demo towards the end of this presentation. So during this presentation, we're pretty much going to concentrate on this core little group. We're going to concentrate on vSphere and what's happening in that network layer and what uh, sort of gets uh, changed inside of a building the cloud. We're going to talk about vShield Edge and how it enables uh, some new networking technologies. And then uh, vCloud Director to show you sort of the abstraction. So just to give you a real quick run through of why we have vCloud Director, again, this is not sort of a, it's supposed to be a marketing pitch, but it basically enables three different things. Its first purpose in life is to create a multi-tenant cloud. And what we mean by this is it provides another level of abstraction above vSphere. So who in here has tried to create a cloud just on top of vSphere alone? Anybody? Yeah, there's probably some complexities you run into, like, hey, how do I go ahead and figure out you know, which LUN I want to put this on, and how do I separate those LUNs and make sure that people can't actually see the individual disks on there? So vCloud Director actually provides another level of abstraction above all of this stuff that you'll see in the next picture, 
uh, to give us a little bit better granularity. It also allows uh, sort of a self-service portal. So after it's provided this level of abstraction, it provides a, a user interface that people can get in, do uh, self-creation of virtual machines, self-creation of setting up networks, uh, firewall ports, all these different uh, types of environments. And then the last thing that it puts on top of this is a programmatic interface, a vCloud API. So if you want to get in your head what vCloud Director does, it's basically those three main things. Another level of abstraction, a self-service interface, and a vCloud API. I feel like I'm Steve Jobs. I'm going to talk to you about three things. <laughs> so those are the three things that uh, vCloud Director is doing. If you dive into this in a little bit more detail, here's sort of the blown up architecture. Down at the bottom of this, we see resource pools and network groups and all these types of activities. That's your traditional vSphere environment. So everything down at the very bottom is your vSphere environment. Up above that, you see sort of this middle tier with these vCloud director cells. And that's actually the business end of vCloud director. When you install it, you create these little cells. They're completely stateless entities. So as you need to scale cloud director out to get more horsepower for the user interface, or the transfer proxy, or some of the other services that it offers, you can actually just scale this out by building more vCloud director cells. They're just Red Hat VMs at that point in time. And then to load balance between them, you put a load balancer up top that uh, uh, Charlie will talk about in more detail in a later slide. So it's sort of a scale out architecture on top of your vSphere platform that's already running and existing. If we blow it up even more, there's four main services that vCloud Director uh, offers that you have to really worry about. The first one is the transfer service. That allows you to upload and download VMs. The second thing is a remote console. It's called the console proxy. So you no longer have to actually expose your service console directly to the internet if you want to offer people to get remote console service. We actually have a console proxy. So that's taken into from a networking account. We have the front end UI, just a, a web-based UI. It's actually Flash and Flex-based uh, UI. And then the fourth thing is that vCloud API, which is a REST-based API. So that is also a lot of web traffic. So those are the networking components sort of that you're going to attach to on the top side if you look at uh, Cloud Director in detail. So as we go over and we start to, uh, to build stuff with Cloud Director, we basically have a collection of ESX servers or a collection of vSphere resources down underneath everything. And we typically grab those and we bundle them together into something called a provider virtual data center. And you'll see why this makes sense in a networking world in just a second. So this provider virtual data center is a collection of CPU and memory resources. It's a collection of networking resources and it's a collection of storage resources. And you can think of it like a service tier. Like I can go get a cluster that has HA enabled and really fast disk and really fast networking, put them all together, and now I have like a gold service of a provider VDC. I can go get a non-HA enabled cluster, really slow disk and really slow networking, put them together, and I have sort of a bronze level VDC. And then once I have those service tiers, I hand them out to individual organizations. Now's where the tricky part comes in. Let's say I have an organization and they want to get connected to the network, they want to get connected to the internet, they have a test dev development network, they have a management network that they need to get attached to, a storage network that they get attached to. Well, all these things start getting put together inside of vCloud Director, and this is not supposed to be the vCloud Director networking deep dive. Um, we do have a whole presentation and a whole lab on that. But it starts to look something like this once you put it all together, right? And that's where the networking complexity comes in from a cloud perspective is everything that's going on on vSphere on the right side and everything that's going on on Cloud Director on the left side starts to add up to major, major headache for all the networking people in the world. There's three main things that we run into over and over and over again. Once we start to dive into this picture and people start to blow it up a little bit, we start to realize that, hey, you know, these customers, they come in and they keep requesting all these segregated networks. And so we segregate networks today pretty much by just using VLANs, right? Hey, VLANs are nice, they segregate the traffic, they provide a little bit of security, or at least the sense of security, um, although they're not you know, designed for security. But we provide all these different VLANs to separate all these things out. So here's a typical organization, and they say, hey, you know, I want uh, an internet access link, I need to connect over the MPLS link to our public cloud provider, I need to go and uh, you know, connect backup, I need to connect storage, all these different types of networks. So we're like, hey, here, great. Here's your 10 VLANs. Well, I have another organization that comes in that wants the same setup, and another organization. And pretty soon, I've run out of my 4,000 odd VLANs that I have in the world to play with. And it becomes very problematic. So these VLAN scaling is sort of the first major hurdle that we have to go through. We can solve some of this because we can reuse VLANs. 
I can create another virtual switch, for example, reuse those VLANs over there, and then I can connect those using something like Q and Q tagging. So there is networking technology that can solve some of this. Who in here has ever tried to set up Q and Q tagging and manage it at scale? And we've got a couple of people. I'm surprised you still have hair. Um, you know, it's really problematic at scale to start solving all of these problems. You still have a little bit of hair. Come on. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it's, uh, it's problematic at scale because we have to set these things up, and it's a very manual process. And so this gets away from where we want to be from cloud. Cloud, we want this very dynamic, self-service type of interface. And here we are having to figure out, oh my gosh, where does this VLAN go and where does that VLAN go? And I'm trying to connect 23 over here and 44 over there. And it becomes very problematic from a Q and Q tagging standpoint. So that's our second networking challenge. And we're going to tell you how to solve these in just a second. Our third problem is we have a lot of people that want to federate clouds or do this hybrid cloud thing that VMware came up with, right? Woo, hybrid cloud. Let's all cheer for hybrid cloud. So stretching these VLANs, there's also, again, networking technology that can solve this today. There's plenty of different uh, options that you have out there. But figuring out how to do that at scale and make sure that you're not overlapping these VLANs from point to point also becomes a big problem. So those are really the three things that people want to do. They want to give out a bunch of VLANs to people, and they end up running out. They want to start stretching these VLANs across environments, and then they want to try and bridge all these VLANs together uh, using something like Q and Q tagging. So those are our three main challenges that we're going to talk about right here. If we look at this, there is a way to actually bridge stuff without using VLANs today. So vCloud Director uses something from the vShield appliance called vCloud Director Network Isolation, VCDNI is the abbreviation for this. And it's a way to actually stretch networks across hosts without the use of VLANs. What we do is we actually use Mac and Mac encapsulation to do this. Since the virtual switches on all the ESX hosts, right, this actually requires a virtual distributed switch, either the VMware switch or the Cisco switch, but it requires a distributed switch. And what happens is we know where all the VLANs are, where all of those MAC addresses are, and so we can say, hey, you want to go over to that VM that's sitting over there, I can actually encapsulate you in a MAC address that's the ESX host MAC address over there, send you directly over there. The ESX host on the receiving end knows, hey, I got a, uh, a VCDNI packet, open it back up, and then ship it up to the actual VM that you're originally trying to do this. So by using this Mac and Mac encapsulation, we can automatically configure this and stretch uh, layer two networks across inside of a site. This is inside of a site only right now. So VCD and I, a new concept, automatically happens on the back end. Anybody familiar with Lab Manager? Some people? Yeah, a lot of Lab Manager old school hacks. Perfect. So this is very similar to host spanning inside of the lab manager world. Best thing is, we don't need all those little agents running around and the service VMs and all this other stuff that gets created in the old lab manager world. This happens inside of the distributed switch by default. So moving on, I talked a little bit about vShield and the use of VCDNI. So that's one of the use cases for it. The other use case is to help us with some of this isolation that we have inside of the environment. So a lot of people have come and they said, okay, we're going to have all these different organizations and they're all going to get connected and we want to use sort of this physical firewall environment or we want to provide traffic isolation from them. For example, inside of our drawing here, I have two screens in this room, so I don't know how this is going to work with a laser pointer. <laughs> I guess I can point out both directions like this. I may blind you, Charlie. Sure. Um, so what happens in this particular case is I have an organization over here that's connected to my external network. Pretend the external network is the internet. I want to provide common internet access. And I have another organization that's also connected to this external network. Now, if I didn't have any sort of firewalling or protection between those two, they can actually see each other's networks, right? They can see each other's traffic, and that's not good in a multi-tenant cloud approach. So what we've done is we've allowed you to connect stuff in what we call a NAT routed mode. Don't worry, I'm not going to hit you with a green <laughs> laser. Uh, a NAT routed mode where it protects um, the organization by doing NAT translation, essentially, from seeing all of the other traffic that's on there. So it's a way for us to still isolate people, and all we have to do is simply inside of the uh, organization when we create it, we say, hey, connect in a NAT routed mode. It deploys a vShield edge automatically to the appropriate host. It configures the vShield edge for you automatically, and everybody is happy. Now, vShield edge actually does provide a couple of other services. It provides not only NAT services, but it can also do DHCP services. 
So it can offer DHCP services up to the organization. It can do, um, wow, port forwarding, IP masquerading, and firewall services also up there. Not in the interface, but enabled in vShield Edge, it can also do point-to-point -point VPN services as well as load balancing services. So this is sort of out of the box functionality inside of the vShield Edge appliance that's part of the vShield manager. And again, these get deployed automatically and configured by the vCloud director. Now the nice thing about this is we can give control of this configuration like the firewalling services or the DHCP services selectively to organization admins. So let's say finance signs up and they come into our cloud. We can say, all right, Mr. Finance person, here you go, you're in charge of your own DHCP scope. It's only gonna be in your little playland. Nobody else sees it anyways. Uh, you're in charge of your own firewall services. So it's sort of a self-service for all these wraparound services, their own load balancing services and everything inside of the cloud. So it's a really powerful way to do this. Now you might be saying, hey, there's no way in the world that I'm gonna be able to get this past you know, the networking guys and the security people and all these other people that are running around in the world. And you might be partially correct, right? They wanna use their own tools. For example, Charlie's gonna kill me if I come over here and say, sorry, F5, we've just created everything that replaces all of your functionality. <laughs> it's beautiful world, right? Not very partner-like of us. So Charlie's gonna tell you exactly how we've extended this vCloud Edge device to our partner ecosystem as well. Before we kind of move on, were there any questions just around this stuff uh, on the edge or anything we've talked about so far? Got one question back here. Yeah, perfect question. So he asked, is the Mac and Mac encapsulation trickery, wizardry, the VCDNI stuff that we do, is it proprietary, is it open, you know, how does it work if I'm using other stuff inside of my environment? So the answer is yes, it's a proprietary approach right now that we're taking, just like our host banning uh, that we do. It's built for in-site only, so you're not gonna use it to stretch across uh, different sites or different geos. Um, and the follow-up answer to that is we're working with a lot of the leading networking vendors to figure out how to use it you know, inside of their uh, ecosystem as well, whether we leverage stuff that they put in their switches and just enable it in the VCD interface, whether we come up with some common standard that everybody you know, should follow and do for that. All that's on the table and actually being discussed right now. So we're moving towards the standards approach, but standards take like a you know, year and a half to figure out, <laughs> and all that integration stuff takes a while to figure out. So. We're moving down the path. So it does not use like EBD or MMT? No, it does not use any of the standards that are there right now in the physical switching world. We decided to go our own little proprietary lock you in approach way. <laughs> I know, boo, bad for us, but uh, that's what we did for right now. Any others? Okay. So yeah, as Mike was talking about, vShield Edge gives you a lot of this really nice functionality out of the box, but security teams, network teams, you know, you introduce a new, uh, a new uh, tool to them and say, hey, this is great, it comes out. They're used to functionality that they have. There's maybe standards or practices in your own environment. What's nice about vCloud Director and sort of the, the cloud architecture in general is that it's very extensible. Um, you can build upon the network features that are in there and use them and extend them or use other tools. It's all sort of interoperable uh, in most cases. So for example, in sort of the edge case where you've got uh, network address translation happening and you know, there is some load balancing in there, uh, you can take advantage of virtual appliances and, and virtual machines which are providing network services or infrastructure services and one example is you know, the F5, um, I'll do a little plug there, with, with the virtual edition. In that case, you know, it's extending out the load balancing and the layer seven uh, capabilities that you would want to use within an organization or within a virtual appliance or a virtual uh, a V app. So as part of an application and load balancing, you may be uh, leveraging you know, health monitoring or actually do full content inspection and do additional things. So all that can be packaged within your own V app deployed into an organization and uh, you can use and rely on those for some of the more advanced features that you may want. Uh, if you're used to say, I don't know if Checkpoint has a virtual appliance, but you know, you, that, that's, the, that's the approach here. So it's fully extensible and you can deploy these within the cloud. Um, 
kind of moving on. So Mike talked about this is the rough architecture of Cloud Director. And within each one of these cells, this is how it's, it's very horizontally scalable, they're all stateless. So every one of those cells can perform any of the four functions that it has. And just a reminder, so there's the, the transfer service, you know, that console proxy, uh, the API, and uh, just sort of the GUI front end. Now, when you start thinking about scale, there's, you know, you may have, um, you know, certain cells that you want to dedicate or put extra, extra fast networking on for high bandwidth for the transport service. So that's where you're going to be doing uploads of these gigabyte, you know, VMDKs and vApps. So when you run out of capacity there, you could either just add another cell, which is equally handling all those things against the load balancer, or be a little bit smarter and scale them in such a way, this will go, uh, so you can use layer seven load balancing and uh, actually route traffic for those individual tasks to specific cells. So you can do some specialization layer. And when you run out of capacity, you know, everybody's looking at consoles, that may be the function that you really want to scale, and so you can intelligently add capacity and just route that function to that cell. If you know, there is a high availability issue, something dies, of course, any one of those can still handle any function. But uh, to be a little more intelligent, use traffic management and scale out just the components that you need or add the capacity that you need. Uh, another best practice here is really providing security of transport. You're uploading your applications, you're providing administrative access to these cells, all of that should be encrypted. And in a cloud environment, public cloud, uh, there's a lot of volume of traffic here. So offloading some of that into you know, an appliance which fronts gigabytes of traffic uh, can be done much more efficiently sort of in, in, a, in a hardware appliance. And just kind of thinking about what's the capacity, what's my scale, uh, the, a high volume, high throughput environment you know, with, with one appliance, you may be able to do 36 gigs of throughput, or you could offload that and try and do each one of those VMs providing that SSL. It's not quite as efficient. But in general, having SSL and in a secure encryption uh, for each one of those access points, your APIs, your uploads, your downloads, the administrative access is all uh, definitely a best practice. So a quick little marketing blurb, and I think that red circle is in the wrong spot, but one of the things that Gartner is, everybody's trying to figure out this cloud thing and you know, what's holding customers back from, from sort of being more aggressive and adopting advanced virtualization. From, from this particular survey, and I'm curious to see if you guys agree, they claim that it's the operational process and, and all the moving parts that are involved that sort of held uh, customers back from being more aggressive in their deployments. So would you kind of agree or disagree that it's the moving parts that are involved? Show of hands, yes, I see a couple of head nods. So the idea here, what they're saying is that there's, you know, everything's dynamic, there's a lot of agility moving around, and there, uh, to date there's still a lot of, or a lack of process or automation to help streamline some of these complex functions that can happen in the cloud. And really, dynamic, uh, that dynamic agility, the, the integration between your storage and your network and your compute, and this environment that can change very rapidly gives you a lot of flexibility and power, but trying to do each one of those steps manually or understand the, the, uh, the different contact points can get complicated very quickly. The way the Cloud Director does much of what it does, everything when it can, talks to vSphere and when it's dealing with storage, that's, you know, it's an abstraction layer above vSphere and vCenter, but it's talking API calls back into vSphere to do everything that it's doing. So that layer, that, that connectivity between Cloud Director and vSphere is the API. Same thing with the storage APIs. You know, having this layer of, of automation with a programmatic interface really lets you do complex operations in workflows. And those workflows can be tested and reproducible. And you sort of take out the human element that can cause uh, or add risk and, and cause problems. So one of the things that are sort of missing from, from those three is having an API at the network layer. The network is really just as dynamic or should be just as dynamic as everything else when you're talking about reconfiguring organizational networks on the fly and giving that control to the operators and the admins of those organizations to define their own networks and have you know, VLANs and, and um, just all of that control. There's, there's a lot of flexibility from the network layer and the network needs to have that dynamic nature. So both into vCenter as well as to Cloud Director. Um, 
automating a lot of that. So to bring it all together, really, there's a lot of moving parts. And orchestration automation is really a very fundamental part of what cloud is and achieving the benefits of cloud. And there's a lot of tools to do this. Um, VMware has Orchestrator. And if for some of you, they had some sessions uh, where they were showing off some of the cloud or vCloud uh, plugins into Orchestrator that are coming. Um, a lot of folks use homegrown tools. There's various other ecosystem partners that have automation tools. But really, that API is sort of the key there to uh, enable the flexible and dynamic nature. So let's move a little bit on. Uh, we've got your sort of cloud infrastructure built, your cloud director, uh, public or private. We start thinking about accessing this and how do you get to and leverage and, and actually take advantage of these, these uh, services. So with Cloud Director, you've got a provider admin. This is your provider who sets up the environment, and he's going to start configuring and doing things in this cloud environment. Well, to do that, you want to make sure it's encrypted, as we talked about before. So he sets up his organization, you know, provides his resource pools, and hands those off to now an organizational administrator. That organizational administrator is, looks at his environment, OK, great, now we're going to start deploying the apps. So, and actually deploying a vApp, in terms of what the network needs to do, you're going to be uploading and downloading really big files, really big groups of virtual machines into and out of that cloud. And uh, WAN optimization plays a huge part in improving that experience and actually improving just the, uh, the process of moving gigs of traffic into and out of this cloud. Uh, from WAN optimization standpoint, there's protocol optimizations you can do, compression, data deduplication, all of these types of features will uh, accelerate the deployment of these uh, applications into and out of the cloud and just improve the, the overall uh, cost of doing that. So once you have an app or a vApp out there, then you have various application administrators. They have a role, they have a little more restricted access within that cloud, but to give them access, you want to restrict it through authentication and authorization. You know, typically, you think of this as firewall or VPN access into that particular provider's organization and into that particular, uh, say, set of hosts which make up the app. And then finally, you have application clients. These are the end users who are signing on and getting to Outlook or rather Exchange or whatever your application may be. And there you want to um, consider just ex how, you know, make that end user experience as, as good as you can or as fast as possible. And things like caching, compression can come into play here, just improving that uh, network performance. So this set of services, this set of features around just getting from the, the roles that you have and the particular function or endpoint that they're doing, all of that is uh, this sort of category of application delivery networking. And it's often, you know, we talk about VLANs and subnets and, and that type of thing, but the app delivery network is really getting you the last mile between that end user and the endpoint. So these are kind of some of the things to think about. So how many of you leverage public clouds today? Actually using them in your environment. Let's see a couple. Um, this hybrid cloud architecture. So VMware has been pushing it a lot, and it's this concept of, hey, we're, we're working on building a private cloud, or we're looking at our data center, improving the efficiency with, with these abstractions. But public cloud is sort of off in the distance. You know, how can we look at leveraging that today? So by definition, when we talk about, or what I'm going to talk about, hybrid cloud, it's this notion of using your own resources, your own data center, but reaching out and, and taking or, or leveraging the benefit that is in the public cloud. And in terms of applications, having an application actually span a private and public cloud in an active, active uh, scenario. So, why would you ever do this? Um, if you've got a public cloud out there, you may use it for automated failover or high availability, having a public cloud be the destination for disaster recovery. Um, this notion of elastic applications is you know, starting with a, an app in your private environment, but maybe it's a, you know, it's a big marketing app for the holiday season, and you have unknown traffic requirements you know, there may be a huge surge in traffic because Britney Spears did something or whatever. And, you know, capacity runs out in your private cloud. You could leverage public cloud and expand that app, have it actually reach out and leverage both at the same time. Some of the architectural features that are necessary to achieve a hybrid cloud 
are, you know, first and foremost, sort of glo global traffic management. The end user needs one entry point that will direct them to the right location, whether it's private and public, and understand when to send them in that location. Um, having intelligent persistence is a requirement. Um, this is the scenario you think of, you start shopping, uh, going to Amazon or what have you. Once you start moving and navigating that site, you have a persistent session to that application server. You wanna make sure that that stays persistent, even if there are multiple app instances, and have the traffic management understand you know, and maintain that connection and that persistence between you and the server. Um, anytime you're talking about moving apps or expanding capacity, that's where that network API comes in, the dynamic natures that's gonna be there. And then having L layer seven sort of content inspection and routing helps you achieve some of these things a little more efficiently. So the other component of a hybrid cloud is really connecting those two cloud instances. Um, in this case, one of the key issues is data. You know, we've all heard the term split brain. If you've got any data or stateful application that has a back-end database and data store, uh, that, you know, you can't really split those two or necessarily want to deploy uh, full replication if it's multiple terabytes or, or what have you. So in a hybrid cloud scenario, there's a, there's a few different uh, partners in the ecosystem that have some solutions here, but, you know, start thinking of things like dynamic caching and, and also data replication. But doing that over any distance across the internet or across the WAN, again, there's, there's a lot of bandwidth considerations and latency considerations that come into play. So mitigating some of the impact of, those, uh, of the WAN conditions themselves, you can look into WAN optimization, like data deduplication, uh, compression, these types of things, which minimize the amount of traffic that you've got to send over and also accelerates just the, the data flow so your application and user experience is, uh, maintains you know, high performance. Uh, a final kind of use case here is thinking of federated authentication and authorization. So one of the big concerns I've heard from my customers and, and partners is often, um, you know, hey, public cloud is great, but you know, we're never gonna give, give up control of our users. We're not gonna give control of our data. That's just, it's too core to the business. So if you think of federated authentication, what you can do is leverage both public and private cloud and, and gain the benefits of you know, the cost that uh, public cloud affords. You know, you pay for what you use. So by leveraging sort of global traffic management, what you can do is as a new user comes in through an application, the global traffic management says, hey, I've never seen you before. I'm gonna route you to the private data center. And at that point, they get authenticated to your directory service, your Active Directory, LDAP, and can do a lot of you know, very high PKI, two-factor, whatever it is, to establish that connectivity and that ownership and that, that uh, uh, authentication authorization. Once that's done and that session has been established, then you can direct the rest of the user or the rest of the requests to either the public or private. But in this case, you know, leveraging the compute resources that are much more cost uh, efficient and cost effective in public cloud and still maintain all of your ownership in the private cloud. And it is that global traffic management and that uh, sort of layer seven awareness of who that user is, what is the state of that session that they have, have they been authenticated, uh, that, that makes this possible. So having that session affinity and the persistence and making sure they get authenticated and routed and keeping that ownership and that control in the enterprise and still leverage public cloud for compute. Any questions on this or that I've covered so far? Uh, SAML. SAML is definitely one um, solution you can do there. If you're asking if F5 does SAML, uh, today we don't. We can, in, in some ways, we can work on it, uh, uh, do some things there, but we don't have a SAML implementation. And vCloud Director will have SAML in a future release. We're yeah. working on that right now. Yes. So the question was, everything I've said is true of any load balancer, so there hasn't, there, or is there any true integration between F5 and, and Cloud Director? So I would argue very strongly that it's not true of every load balancer, uh, but that's diving into some of the details, and I don't want to bring this into a vendor discussion. But uh, in terms of specific integration, absolutely one of the, the, the demo we're going to show at the end 
is showing how we've, we've used both of the current releases to do a, a full implementation that spans a lot of these challenges. Using vCloud, yes, using vCloud Director and, and F5 products. This particular demo doesn't use VCO, the orchestrator engine, but we have oh, another works. demo together that actually does use VCO. Right. Yes? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. So the question, if anybody didn't hear it, is, you know, I see this other thing, and I'll move to the public cloud and use hybrid to the public cloud at some point, but I have a few data centers. Can I just treat them all as independent clouds and federate them together and basically make a hybrid cloud? And the answer is, yeah. There's a lot of people that are doing that today. As a matter of fact, uh, some of what we call the activate people, but the private clouds that we've built so far, some of them were on the show floor. Some of them actually gave presentations here. Demonstrate just that, what they've done with sort of a federated approach where they have multiple data centers. And there's even companies that have gotten together and built what we call community clouds. Like there's a bunch of pharmas that have gotten together recently and said, hey, I have uh, extra capacity, you have extra capacity. We're not really going out to the public cloud. We trust each other because we're both you know, FDA regulated. Let's do hybrid cloud to each other, essentially. You, know, you come to my cloud, I'll go into your cloud. So that's also happening in the space. Yeah, and we've seen, I mean, there's um, you know, very large social networking sites and things like that that have multiple data centers um, and they're doing exactly this type of thing. They'll do some federated uh, for the storage end and then leverage the rest of their sites just as, as multi-cloud deployments, if you will. In the no, back. Yeah. How does it interact with what? Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, so the question was, um, see if I get this right, the VCD and I stuff that we talked about, the network isolation, how does it interact with the physical network stuff that's going on, like the ACLs and things like that, right, to prevent it from going on? So essentially to it, it just looks like a VM's communicating to a VM with a MAC address. That MAC address just happens to be the ESX host, Nick's MAC address at that point in time but it looks like normal everyday traffic. Now there's one caveat, is that uh, we added an extra MAC address on there, you know, on the front. So you actually need to increase your MTU size. So that's the only thing that you really have to worry about from a physical network change that goes on. So you go from the default 1500 to 1504, unless you want to, you know, suffer a little bit of performance degradation because it'll chunk up the packets at that point in time if you haven't done that. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I mean, if you've enabled jumbo frames or you've done any MPLS network stuff or anything like that, you've already increased it usually. Um, so that's about the only thing you have to do on the physical network. Otherwise, it just looks like regular old traffic going from ESX host to ESX host. Mm-hmm. So if you have a, an IP-based ACL, so this is all layer two. We're stretching a layer two network across, right? So your ACL, your layer three ACL will never get hit at that point in time. Does it break the network security? So we can probably take this conversation offline just to drill down on a little bit more. But from a network security perspective, you know, sure, if you want to prevent all that traffic from going between one host to another host, you could do that and break VCD&I, but if you're setting up VCD&I, you're probably also the guy that's going to open up those ACLs so that the traffic can flow between those two particular hosts, or three or four or five hosts. Right. So it just depends on, you know, if you want to use it, yeah, I mean, if you've blocked everything from going anywhere from a layer two broadcast domain perspective, you can break VCD&I from working. But uh, again, you know, if you're using it, you probably haven't blocked it from a, a layer two perspective. I gotcha. It's reversed. Would VC and I break anything that I have implemented where I don't want VMA to talk to VMB, for example, uh, in the network? So this is all happening at the virtual distributed switch level, right? And we don't have ACLs in the virtual distributed switch today, uh, unless you're using the Nexus 1000V. 
Uh, so you know you can't do it from a Nexus 1000V perspective. So it can still open up the packets, see the IP addresses. It's just an extra MAC address on top of it, right? So if you're opening up the packet, it'll still look the same. But we can take it offline from a conversation perspective in the interest of time. Just find me afterwards. I've got plenty of time to go into detail with you, okay? <laughs> So the question was, can the physical F5 take in what? What did you say? Does it take in the Mac to Mac addresses and load balance the Mac to Mac addresses? By the time it's By the physical time F5, it's the it's Mac and Mac stripped off anyways. Right. You're just back to your default packet. When it leaves the ESX host, the Mac and Mac stuff, like if it's going outbound and not going directly to another ESX host for shipment to another VM, the Mac and Mac stuff is stripped off. You're just on a normal. We don't know the difference. Yeah, because you're just on a normal frame at that point in time. So let's, um, just for the sake of time, so we can get to the demo, um, and hopefully this will work here. <clears throat> so we talked about a, a couple of things at the beginning, you know, um, the, the challenges that we've had, VLAN stretching and doing this encapsulation and isolation, um, and taking all those into account, you know, VMware and F5 for the last couple of months uh, have put together a demo um, that I'm going to run through pretty quickly. Just to sort of set it up in the component standpoint, we've used uh, Cloud Director, vCloud Director, and set up a private and public cloud. Um, for an application, we just chose an open source Java, uh, it's a Java pet store, you know, running on Tomcat. For that data layer, where we talk about the split brain issues and sort of having the, the caching, uh, we leveraged Gemstone SQL Fabric, which Gemstone is a company acquired by uh, VMware recently, and that just handles the, the cache synchronization and uh, uh, data consistency between the two sites. Uh, from the global traffic management standpoint, F5 Global Traffic Manager, as well as local traffic manager within each cloud, uh, both a physical appliance on one side and a virtual appliance in the other, just showing that dynamic nature. And all of it was put together and is, is orchestrated using APIs. We didn't use orchestrator in this case, we used our own just sort of uh, homegrown orchestration, uh, mostly for the sake of time, <laughs> to get it by, by VMworld. Um, and what you're going to see is just a visualization that's built, uh, that's querying the APIs in the back end, just to show you what's happening. So I'm going to jump to the video. Um, Got to kill this. Nope. That's not coming up on the screen. It's not coming up on the screen. Let's see. Is there a way to get the video up on the screen? I may need to. There we go. <laughs> No, now you've really screwed it up. Now hmm. they're going to be mad at us. Uh-oh. <laughs> Do you want to fiddle with this, and I'll just kind yes. of talk to it a little more? Start talking to it. So <clears throat> what we did was, uh, you know, it starts off, you have an application just running in the private cloud, in Cloud Director, and as the, so just driving traffic to it, as the traffic increases, um, the F5 is measuring response time, so basically application capacity and uh, has, we've set a threshold there. So when the response time of clients got too long and hit that threshold, that triggers the WMB bursting event. Media. And what happens in the bursting event is Sorry through the that. API calls, we talk to Cloud Director in the public cloud, and what it'll take uh, the vApp, the application vApp that's in the catalog no, there, and start and deploying a new clone from much. the template. So it launches a new uh, instance of the yeah, application in the, in the public cloud. And looks like it may, may be working here. Yep, we got it. Just have to look down at the uh, little monitor screen. OK. We're rolling. Um, here we go, yeah. So yeah, we start off this. I think this is just a showing. There we go. So the initial state, the application's only in the private cloud. And in this case, we have two instances running. See the little traffic light just went to red. What that means those traffic lights are representing the, the state or the threshold of the application in the cloud. So when the threshold is hit, 
we spin up a new instance in the public cloud. Use, wow, this is going really fast. Yeah, hold on. I'll, I'll back up and pause for you. <laughs> hit, hit pause, yeah. Uh, um, perfect. So it spins up a new instance. When that instance is up and running, when the VM is ready to go, then through the APIs, we tell the uh, virtual appliance, the F5 in that case, what that IP address is. So we've queried guest, the uh, VM tools, what the IP address is, how to load balance to it, what the policy is from a traffic management standpoint. And uh, as soon as that registers, hey, I see it, I've checked my health monitors and it's up and running, the global traffic manager now sees it as well. So we can configure the global traffic manager on the fly and tell it about this new public cloud location. So we've dynamically get spun up compute resources, get the application going, spun up the network resources, both locally and globally, and route traffic to both sides at that point. So we've, ex we've expanded out into the public cloud, but say traffic keeps going. So we keep driving load, we keep driving load, and we've now hit the threshold in the public cloud as well. So we can spin up additional instances in the public cloud and start scaling horizontally in that public cloud environment. And it's the same, t it's the same process. You first, uh, vCloud director will spin up new uh, clones from the template when they're ready, we modify the configuration of the uh, traffic management device, the local traffic manager, and as soon as they're up and running, the local LTM will load balance traffic to those new instances. So we're able to dynamically and automatically scale both from the public or from the private into the public cloud and expanding out further into the public cloud. When things die down, traffic starts slowing down, we kind of do this in reverse, but it's done intelligently. So if you were just to spin down a V app or an application instance without any consideration of the network, any users that are persistent to that server would just get their connections dropped. So in this case, rather than doing that, the first step in sort of the contraction of the application is to take that server out of the load balancing pool, wait for the connections to either go to zero or some timeout, uh, which is configurable, and then when there are no more connections, then... Uh, at that point, the cloud director can shut down and either, you know, either suspend or, or remove the VM from the inventory there, and you kind of keep doing that process. So you silently or, or uh, gracefully shut down those VMs once you no longer need that capacity, and you can contract all the way back in so it's just to the private cloud. And at that point, the global traffic management will only send traffic uh, to the private. And so, yeah, this is all, we built this all running. Um, we actually have a deployment guide for those that would uh, like to uh, see the details. But are there any questions? I think we're hitting time just about right. Yes? Yep. <laughs> Uh, today, there's not a virtual edition of the GTM. It, uh, so in this architecture, with the way we built it, it's sitting in the private cloud. And we also, in ours, that, that GTM in the private cloud is a physical LTM, and GTM can run as a software module on the physical LTM. So for redundancy, typically you would have you know, a GTM somewhere else, and that just depends on your network architecture, but there can be redundancy there. Uh, well, not if with you... One. With one. Yeah. If you have one, which is not... I mean, if you have one data center and you lose that data center, you lose your data center. <laughs> yeah. Yes? So ultimately, all of what's backing a cloud is computing resources, so your, your ESX hosts and the storage. So from a capacity standpoint, why you would burst to a public cloud would be, hey, I've got, say, just a cluster of five hosts in my data center. When I've hit the capacity, either from I've run out of storage or I'm using all the CPU that's available, you know, there's a number of different metrics that you have that just determine capacity. When any of those are hit, that may be when you push out to a public cloud where you're paying for how much CPU you use. And they, you know, as a provider, a cloud provider, they're offering that infrastructure and those services for you at cost. Yeah, most of the cloud providers do what we call a pay-as-you-go model, where you can simply, hey, if I spun up 
then I'm paying for it. And if I spin down and get out of the public cloud, then I'm not paying for it. So it's not like you have to dedicate and you know, contract for resources. They also have those models, what we call an allocation pool or a reservation pool, where I'm signing up for a chunk of resources and I'm paying for it whether I use it or not, kind of like cable TV, right? Um, but a lot of, the, in this particular case, this is more for transient workloads is what we call them. They go in, they come out, they go in, they come out. It's better for that, where you're only paying for those resources. And then you can scale as big as you want, well, as big as the cloud provider has resources for, but a lot of them are pretty big out there. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Why the, the private cloud? I think that <laughs> there are a lot of providers that would love for folks to get rid of their private cloud. Um, I think in reality, one of it, you know, cloud is relatively new, public cloud is, is, is relatively new, and you start, you've got applications running today, unless you're a brand new company or you're a brand new initiative that's going to start fresh, um, and you can, you know, first deploy into public, but typically you've already got some infrastructure, you've got something running. And in this example, I mean, there's no reason why the private cloud needed to have cloud director, per se. You may not be fully cloud enabled. Um, to have this type of architecture work. And that's really that hybrid cloud notion. So if, as long as your environment uh, is sort of capable, I mean, the, the glue here is really the, the vCloud API. So um, part of the announcements earlier was the vCloud data center certification, mm -hmm. I believe, and there's cloud providers. And what that essentially says is, hey, we do implement this vCloud API. And it's that, um, you know, the guarantee is saying you have this, this portability between uh, clouds, different cloud providers, uh, your own data center through that API. And that's really the glue that we leveraged here. So you may, you may not have a full true cloud in your private data center, but as long as you can speak to or leverage uh, the APIs, or if you want to do it not orchestrated or not automated, you can just use the GUIs, you know, the, the cloud director front end. So while people are asking questions, if you are leaving, thank you for coming. I realize people are going to have to run. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and fill out your surveys, all yes. fives, all the way down the right-hand side. Does, does cloud director Yeah, so the question was, does vCloud Director actually configure load balancing in vShield Edge right now? Today, it's not exposed in the interface. You'd have to access vShield Edge programmatically through the vShield uh, API, which is pretty easy to do, actually, um, sometimes easier than the vCloud API. But uh, in a future release, kind of the same time frame we're looking at SAML, is the same time frame we're looking at pulling in the load balancing features into the interface. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So the question was, is there any reason why F5 couldn't support those APIs so you could push it to an F5 you know, physical or virtual appliance? And we're absolutely working with these guys on that same exact type of thing. Yeah, one, one just sort of sidebar on that, you know, we're the, in, the, in the Edge product, the, the load balancing, I mean, a lot of the value add and, and benefit of F5, why you would buy an F5 has to do with our health checks, you know, our health monitoring, the APIs that we have, the persistence. I mean, all those things are, you know, the, the advanced traffic management that you're not going to find in Edge. So they can be used in conjunction. You start with Edge for some services, and then it is that, you know, the added benefit, you know, why use checkpoint instead of IP tables. You know, you're, it's those extra features that's the, you know, the ecosystem advantage. Yep. Yeah, a question in the back. I'm just I'm curious, why do you use the video clip? Mm -hmm. Why we use the video clip? Uh, they didn't want us to do live demos at the show <laughs> for some reason. One of the EMC guys actually got yelled at for bringing in a server. <laughs> and also for time. I mean, if yeah, they make sure it worked. On the, um, the show floor, we have we can dive into more detail and we've got more, uh, well, it's, it's still video actually because we didn't bring in real servers, but um, there's, there's a little more detail on this. I mean, if you're interested, you can hook up with us after the fact. I have this very same sort of setup running in my actual lab, live lab. Yep. And if you want to see it live, no smoke and mirrors, we can do that. Yep. <laughs> got time for a couple more questions. Oh, yes. There's one up front here. So automatically, I believe not, because yeah. that's not exposed through the API. Yeah, 
Is well, it? it's exposed to the vShield API, yeah. So the question okay. was, can you set up an IPsec VPN tunnel automatically okay. between the two? And absolutely you can. Um, so there's ways to do that. We have a white paper around it that one of our engineers just wrote. It, again, it's one of those things that's not in the vCloud director interface right now, load balancing in the VPN services, uh, but it is in the vShield Edge product, and so you can actually set that up. That actually <laughs> just so realized getting that into the interface. I completely forgot one of the key points of, <laughs> of this demo, which is pretty embarrassing. But there's, see the line between the two F5s, between public and private cloud? <laughs> so, uh, in addition just to the traffic management, that is a, a tunnel between the local traffic managers in each data center, and that tunnel is, is performing uh, SSL encryption, TCP optimization, and compression. Yep. So it's accelerating the, uh, the database caching layer. So in order for the application to perform well in that public cloud, you really need access, any access that it has to data to be very fast, and so you want it relative uh, uh, locally close to the, the actual application that's running. So there's a lot of database cache consistency happening across that WAN link, and the F5s uh, are providing WAN optimization to do that. So it's accelerating just the application performance as you've pushed it out over latency into some public area. So that's completely forgot to mention that, but that, that's happening here. All right, we got time for one last question, then we'll be outside the doors so the next group can come in. Is there any plan to support SRIOV? Uh, yeah, there are plans. I can't give you an exact date or, uh, or anything like that, unfortunately. But um, yeah, we're looking to support some of these technologies, yeah. So thank you again all for coming. Don't forget the surveys. We're all going to go outside. Uh, so we'll answer your questions outside so the next group can get in here and set up. Okay. Thanks.